Welcome to another coffee table video from Fortune Buchholz of NotFortuneSchool.com. Several people have asked me uh, about the Lenormand decks that I'm using, and you may remember that my last video was about my use of the Burning Serpent here when reading in Pittsburgh at Journeys of Life. But I have quite a few um, other decks that I often use and bring to read with, which I mentioned in that video. And I was asked to review one of them in more detail, that is Neil Lovell's uh, Chelsea Lenormand. So I just wanted to take a couple of minutes, it won't be as long as the last videos I think, and talk a little bit about the Chelsea Lenormand and its pluses or minuses. So uh, if you're thinking about buying this deck or other decks by Neil, uh, he's a very popular and prolific card artist, then hopefully this will guide you in your decision. It can be difficult to make an order from him because of course he's in the UK, which means that for many people there's a lot of expensive tax, shipping, and customs to take into consideration before you actually go ahead and make that order. So I understand that having a lot of information about the deck before you order it helps make up your mind in terms of not only hit this Lenormand but his other Lenormands. He's making several uh, including one with an Arab theme uh, and he's uh, already uh, made kind of one that matches his previous uh, tarot deck, the Tildewick Tarot. So you know you can order all of these uh, and they are beautifully produced but you may just want to know more about them before you put that kind of investment due to the heavy taxes and shipping. I personally found that the taxes, shipping, and customs uh, really equaled the cost of the deck. So this made for me the deck a very heavy purchase and I had to think about it for quite some time before I bought it. So um, with that aside and that caveat up front, I just wanted to go ahead and talk about the deck so that um, you could see how I felt about it, take a closer look at the cards, hear about real life experiences with the deck, and then hopefully make your own decision. If you have any questions, comments, or follow-up, please go ahead and make a comment on my notfortunesfool.com uh, Facebook page or email me and I'll be happy to reply to your comments or make another video. So with that said, let's go ahead and not waste any time. Let's just get started. So when you order the deck from Neil, he sends you it in this wonderful padded envelope. Now, you may say, wait, you know, all the way from England, uh, international mail, you know, is a padded envelope really going to suffice? Uh, you can see all of the evidence of the shipping bobble that happened here is for some reason the post office at first didn't like this deck, wanted to return it, wanted to charge me extra customs. Well, we had quite a postal comedy kind of getting this deck, but eventually it did arrive, so that was all good. But as you can see, it just comes in this heavy-duty padded shipping envelope. Now, for most decks, that would not be enough. I mean, you know, just a shipping envelope with some bubble wrap is not going to be adequate to protect a precious art deck like this is. But luckily, it comes in this handy-dandy tin box. I hope the reflections of my sort of casual side light from my coffee table doesn't... Uh, make that too difficult to read, but as you can see it's a beautiful tin box. It says the Chelsea Lenormand. Nice gold interior, high quality tin box. Of course, all of us readers love decks that comes in boxes because naturally we love to carry these decks around. We're always stuffing our decks in a bag uh, as we go to appointments or just to carry them around to practice. I often practice at coffee houses here like Espresso de Mano or Coffee Tree Roasters or even at Crazy Mocha down the street. So therefore I really appreciate the sturdiness and protection of this lovely tin box. Now notice one thing about this tin box is that even though I've been carrying this deck around for five or six weeks ever since I got it, right, is it has not scratched. It seems to have some kind of nice powder coating. As you can see, it has a beautiful shine. It's very sturdy, and it does seem very scratch-proof, unlike some other uh, tin boxes that I have, uh, which, alas, have begun to show some scratches. So this is a really good box, I have to say, even in the order of tin boxes. Now, um, as one of the first people to order this deck, uh, and to do the pre-order, I also got some bonus cards that would not come with a, a regular order of this deck, and that is these large, beautiful postcards that feature just some of the cards so you can see the art up front. So you see here's the nice dog card. Isn't this a beautiful card? I particularly like this version of the clover. Look at this, this beautiful fox card. What I love about these is you can see the intricate detail of this card all caught up. 
and in nice plain detail here. Let me kind of square these up so the camera focuses better. Look at this. Now that is just a stellar piece of graphic design. Don't you agree? The mice. Here's the lily. Really beautiful graphic design. Quite noticeable, excellent use of color. This uh, deck has two colorways. One is, he calls blue and it has a soft blue and yellow shadow based or shadowy designer type colors uh, that are somewhat reminiscent of the Pixie deck, the Smith Rider deck. Um, but this one is black and red in homage to the playing cards which adorn this deck. You also notice the playing cards their images are suddenly, uh, are subtly sort of embedded in the background of the deck, which gives this deck kind of a feeling of a transformation deck. Very interesting, right? What do you think of this? Very interesting image, right? Very decorative, but still quite readable. Look at this. This is possibly one of my favorite designs in the whole deck, the ring. Look how skillfully he has put the club here in the background while still emphasizing the readability of the ring. Love that. The mountain here, again, excellent use of red and black. This is something where you really want to note the art, artistic quality of the coloration, the artistic quality of the borders, and of course this wonderful arts and crafts type font that he's using on this deck. And here we go. Look at this. Isn't that really amazing? Again, the detail and elegance of these designs are very, very interesting, and they're quite striking, right? Uh, clients, uh, the rare clients who've chosen this deck, once they get over what seems to them the drab colors in comparison to Robert Place and Rachel Pollock's Burning Serpent, they really like the design, and many of the people here who have chosen it uh, in Pittsburgh understand the art references that are made here. So let's go ahead and talk about the art references that are made here for a moment. So uh, Neil Lavelle began as like a branding kind of guy. He worked for a global consultancy in England. He traveled around. So he has this big corporate background in communications and design at, at a large global agency. But uh, he became less and less interested in that commercial aspect and more and more interested in the actual graphic design. So as a result, he left that job, opened his own private graphic design firm, and sort of on a lark started making cards. He had a long history of interest in cards. Some of you may have seen floating around drafts of the Nijinsky tarot uh, from the 90s and that was his first uh, experiment with decks but his his big success and kind of his breakthrough deck came through I think with the Tildwick tarot which uh, was very popular among collectors uh, due to its luxurious gold edges and its very subtle design which took uh, card images and card iconography and blended it into the background, much as you saw he did with uh, this deck. Uh, that deck, the Tildewick Tarot, was kind of based on the concept of the English country house. It had an understated, almost haunted feeling, as if there was this empty, large, Miss Marple type country house where something interesting or macabre was about to happen or had happened. There was some sense of the spiritual, almost ghostly, and there was a sense that the tarot sort of hovered in this atmospheric and even liminal space. So um, that was an extremely uh, interesting deck. It, it was made with collage, collage uh, and a mixture of unique and hand-drawn elements is something that he does a lot. And I think it's the mainstay of his repertoire is this unusual mix of collage. Uh, so there's found art, changed art, redrawn art, and then also his own computer-generated art. So and that's kind of the style. The style of this particular deck, of course, as I think everyone can see just from looking at it, right, is that of Moser, right? Now, not everyone may be familiar immediately with the name Colum and Moser, but of course everyone is familiar with the style, right? This is a style from the Vienna Succession that is a Klimt type style and indeed Moser was an artist who was closely associated with that Vienna movement. He was part of the Vienna uh, Werkstatt and uh, he worked very closely with Klimt and Joseph Hoffman. Uh, he was most famous for all kinds of design, particularly graphic design like this uh, in this style. And he also was very famous for his participation in an artistic magazine, Vera Sacrum, which uh, has this kind of mystical 
uh, spiritual quality while still in this interesting style, right? So uh, Moser eventually became dissatisfied with the movement and he left it, but um, certainly he was very active in it for a long time. And the style is certainly a recognized uh, part of that movement and of the succession. And he's a key figure in that succession. So if you like the Art Nouveau, if you like the arts and crafts movements, you'll actually love this deck and you'll see some of the intricacies of Moser's inspiration in this deck. So if that's your cup of tea, then you'll absolutely love this deck. Now let's go ahead and take a look at some of the smaller cards. You see how wonderful the designs are when they're very large in these postcards, but you see the deck itself, is kind of, you know, a smaller size, not quite as small as a Lenormand size, but you know, it's definitely like a poker deck size here. And you can see it's heavily la laminated. You can see a, the shine in the gloss. Let me show you the card back. I'm gonna tilt it away from the light here so that you can actually see more of the design and less of the reflections. Right, and you can just kind of see here the key, Bear, right? So uh, this is a really beautiful man card. I love this. I think that this particular man card in the man image actually varies a bit from the style. The man sort of has a touch of the Art Nouveau to me in his flowing lines. He, he seems almost a bit airte, but you know, I forgive this uh, touch or two. He's not wedded to any particular style, right? He can be creative and he can, you know, blend these styles as he sees fit. This is a wonderful fox. All right. So you can see, again, this is the smaller version of the stork that you saw larger earlier. And again, here you can clearly see how the playing card element, which is usually a distracting insert on the card, has been placed into the background. Again, this is something that makes it reminiscent of a playing card deck, of a transformation deck. And so this deck is really very interesting in that it's a traditional Lenormand, it blends different styles, and it also throws in elements of the playing cards transformation deck. So I think that that's something that many people will find intriguing. So I like this deck a lot. I like its artistic quality. Um, I like the quality of the cardstock, which is very heavy. And I like the lamination, which is a bit slick. So some people may not like it. The one thing, however, and this is my big caveat, and I think this is why many people uh, sort of skip it by, right? At, even after they get over the bright color thing and the small card thing that, you know, we've talked about earlier in terms of the burning serpent. Um, you know, and those are two qualities that people really love about the Burning Serpent is the large cards, the bright colors, the silky cardstock. This has a stiffer cardstock. It's, sli it's slicker. So when they pick it up to take a look at it, you know, to try to choose a deck for their reading, they may just not have the same haptic uh, feeling for it that they have for the Burning Serpent because it is slicker. It has kind of a cool feeling to the touch, which is unusual. I don't know what causes that. I don't know if that's a quality of the lamination. It, it seems you know how marble takes the heat from your hand when you touch it? There's something about this deck, it seems to take the heat out of your hand. So it's it's a literally cooling deck, right? It's very intellectual in terms of its art style. It has this very restrained, crisp, uh, I would say elegant or maybe even aesthetic colorway. And when people see it, you know, it's they have to adjust to it and it's not to everybody's taste but uh, for those who do love it who get the concept I mean this kind of has also a Japanese feeling to it right in in the store here um, they get it and they they do in fact like it but the big downside to this is the stiffness of the cardstock I mean I appreciate a thick heavy cardstock but dude I absolutely cannot riffle shuffle cascade or spring this deck right so when I ask people to read with me or sit with me while while we talk together about cards I, I ask them to do their own shuffling most people want to shuffle and I generally ask people to shuffle six or seven times to make sure that the 36 card the Normand is in fact fully randomized but it's difficult for them to do an actual full shuffle because the cardstock is so stiff I can't do it I mean I've had it for weeks now I've been trying to shuffle it I cannot loosen this cardstock up so 
often what people suggest for cardstock uh, like this, right, is that you take the card and you absolutely bend it and run it roughly against the edge of a wooden surface such as the back of a chair or the side of a table. Now, I pay a lot of money for this deck and I don't really want to like rough it up that much. So, I hope that in his next decks, he can, he maintains the quality of the cardstock while making it a little easier to, you know, riffle shuffle. I understand that not everyone else riffle shuffles their decks. Not everyone has the card handling skills or the cardistry to do some of the things with the deck that I think are important or that I just like to do as a courtesy to clients so that you get a sort of a moment of theater to help make the card reading more special. But, you know, if you do like to do those things and, and I I think there are a fair number of us who actually get those skills and try to incorporate that, you know, to add a sense of uh, a sense of power to the experience, right? Then uh, you might find that a little more difficult. Maybe he'll keep this in mind, you know, as he makes new decks and, and make it just a tad less stiff, right? So it's easy to, sh to shuffle or move one or two decks, right? But it's very difficult because of the deck slickness to do a one-handed cut, to do a one-handed manipulation. And as I said, I absolutely cannot do a, a two-handed cascade, which of course, you know, is one of my specialties, my fancy, you know, riffle shuffle cascade and spring. So, that you know that's the big downside um, of the deck for me uh, otherwise if you find that people like this beautiful style if they like this intricate graphic design then I think that you'll find that they love this deck so um, after all those pros and the only really one or two cons stiff stiff card slick deck you know it may still be worth the cost of the deck and the cost of the customs at shipping and taxes. Now, of course, we can't blame Neil, right, for the cost of the customs, the cost of the shipping, and the cost of taxes. These are always going to be art decks, collector's decks, in very limited editions. He always publishes independently. He never uses a major house to do a reprint, right? So these decks are going to appreciate significantly in value due to their design quality, right? Uh, so Take that into consideration too. Maybe you won't use it for your professional readings, but you may want to consider uh, investing in his decks despite the high taxes and shipping costs, it, just because I feel certain that they're going to be worth a lot of money in the future. I know I've bought decks that were only 40 or $60 as limited editions when they were new, and then only three or four years later had people turn around and offer me $500 for them because there aren't any more on the market, they're not being reprinted in the same quality, and these limited edition decks, when they become popular, can appreciate considerably. So um, think about that, uh, take that into account, and definitely do follow Neil uh, he does have a Facebook page, and he also has a wonderful um, uh, a wonderful website, which I will link to uh, as a caption to this video. So that way, you don't have to try to you know write it down as I say it. So thanks so much. If you again, if you have any questions, concerns, or you want any follow up, please don't hesitate to ask. In the meantime, uh, again, thank you for your time, and look me up on notfortunesfool.com or on my Facebook page, Not Fortunes Fool. Thanks, and have a great day.